Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This year marks the 100th anniversary since the publication of Martin Buber's I and Thou, a book which in the minds of many is the most important theological tract of the 20th century of any faith tradition. The title of the book encapsulates Buber's theology of dialogue for which he is most famous. In brief, a person can stand in relationship to another in one of two ways, I and thou in the German, or I it in the German ich sie or ich du, sie being the formal German second person on personal pronoun, and do the pronoun reserved for an intimate. Most of our relationships are of the former, the I-it kind, transactional, guarded, and limited. We can, however, establish I-thou bounds, bonds, those elemental relationships where we bring the fullness of our authentic selves into dialogue with another, be it a person, nature, or God, connections of openness, directness, mutuality, and presence. Buber contended that sanctity is found not just in the vertical between the earth and the heaven, but also in the horizontal between one person and another. There too, if not especially there, God's presence can be made manifest. Given the anniversary, I encourage you to put the book on your summer reading list, so I warn you, it's not easy stuff. At the very least, you will impress your friends as you doze away on the beach with a copy of I and Thou splayed open on your sleeping chest. <laughs> this morning, it's not Buber's book that I want to discuss, but the story of how he got to it. Buber was born in 1878. By the 19-teens, he was already a public figure of considerable renown. He had written on Eastern mysticism, established himself as a formidable philosophical voice, assumed leadership positions in the nascent Zionist movement, and brought Hasidism to a public by way of popular translations, such as the tales of Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaff. And then in the summer of 1914, he experienced a life-changing and tragic incident. He was visited by a young man who had sought him out, as many did, for counsel. A kind man, Buber greeted the youth, entertained his questions, and cordially ended the meeting without incident. In the weeks to follow, Buber learned that the young man's visit was anything but casual. He had come to Buber in despair, in Buber's words, not for a chat, but for a decision. Soon after the meeting, Buber discovered that this person, this young person, had taken his own life. He had committed suicide. Buber was shaken to the core, chastising himself for not seeing the loneliness of the young man, for having failed to recognize the condition of the anxious soul before him. Buber underwent what he would later call a conversion. No longer was the religious experience to be defined by extraction, exaltation, and ecstasy. Buber understood that the greatest religious deed one person can perform is to open oneself in dialogue with another, a tragedy, a suicide of a young man that gave life to one of the greatest theological meditations of all time. This month of May is National Mental Health Month, a subject about which we should speak about every month, and this morning, I want to focus specifically on youth. A recent study from the National Institute of Mental Health revealed that one in six youth in our country experience a mental health disorder each year, with less than half receiving treatment. Recent data from the Center for Disease Control found that suicide rates amongst youth have increased by more than 60 percent between 2007 and 2018. Emergency rooms visits by adolescents for anxiety disorders and self-harm rising sharply, numbers that are much higher for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender teens, numbers that continue to climb for all youth since COVID. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, approximately 9% of high school students in grades 9 through 12 
have attempted suicide, and up to 20% have thought about it. Sobering as the statistics, the tragedy of a single teen inflicting harm onto themselves is the only data point that really matters. As a rabbi, it feels like no week and sometimes no day goes by that I'm not made aware of a teen in our community seeking care or being hospitalized. As a parent, a father to four young adults, it all cuts very close to the bone. But by the grace of God, go I. That young person standing before Boober stands before us all today. No family, no school, no community, certainly not the Jewish community, is immune. And whatever my pastoral training, I know my limits. I'm not a sociologist or a psychotherapist, but as I've thought, sought counsel from professionals to make sense of what we're living through, I've come to understand that we're living through a perfect storm of events giving rise to our present crisis in teen mental health. Anxiety and depression are not new, certainly not for teens. Nor for that matter is impulsivity. It's a normal part of adolescence. The brain is still developing, and young adults don't always have the cognitive capacity to be future-oriented, to think about the long-term consequences of their choices. I'm told there are some medical trends being studied, a precipitous rise in ADHD, a decline in the age of puberty. Binge drinking and smoking may be down, but access to amphetamines and guns are up, and there is a severe shortage of therapists and treatment options. The inner working of the human mind is the final frontier. Much as researchers may know, there is far more that we do not. What we do know is that to be a young person today is much more complicated than it was when I was a teen. There was once a time when if you wanted, to, if someone was to be mean to you, they would call you a nasty name or pass a note to hurt your feelings. A hurt to be sure, but a sting that could dissolve by the time you were on the playground. In an internet era, nastiness is not only instantaneous, but it's public and it's permanent. A cruel comment or picture, a text or a video about someone's sexuality, body, or otherwise that spreads beyond retrieval, at which point the object of the cruelty is left hostage to it, to read it over and over again obsessing. Mean kids are not new. It is the vehicles for disseminating meanness that are new and toxic. And the harmful effects of the internet come in other forms as well. In a world where we post the vacations we go on, the parties we attend, and the colleges to which we get accepted, those left out of that carefully curated public life are left emotionally bereft. Over the last few months, high school seniors went through the grinding process of college admissions, a journey so unpleasant that it is a norm, not the exception, that a child needs psychological support to get through it. And while one may be dismissive, saying these are just the champagne problems that come with privilege, try telling that to the parent of a kid who's turned to drugs, to self-harm, developed an eating disorder, or attempted suicide in the face of disappointment. It doesn't matter how you see the world. What matters is how that teen sees the world. A youth who, in the face of failure, shame, or heartache, not only cannot see a path forward, but also believes that they are the only ones who have ever felt this way. And then throw into the mix the cumulative effects of two years of COVID, delayed socialization, isolation, and you begin to understand what our teens face. Today's Haftorah offers two competing psychological portraits. First, a tree planted by the water, rooted, resplendent, and well able to withstand the elements. Our youth are akin to the second image, withered, unrooted, unable to see the good, and incapable of fending off the slings and arrows of our unforgiving world. And it's that, at that moment, when that brittle and bruised youth stands at the crossroads of despair and decision, believing that leaving this world is better than staying in it, eyeing the option of doing harm to themselves or others, that we as individuals and as a community must be present. First and foremost, and I hope this morning is a step in the right direction, we need to remove the stigma around mental illness. Last week I sat in council with a parent in the community whose friends have no idea what's going on with her son for fear of the cascade of social repercussions for their child and for themselves. In our conversations regarding chesed, our Bikur Cholim efforts, in all that we do 
we must reject any differentiation between physical and mental health. It's why at Cantor Davis's Council, we now speak of mental illness and addiction in our prayers for healing. It's why I am so deeply proud that our fabulous youth director, Ariel Gluck, is also an LMSW. It's why we're presently looking for a social worker to resource the clergy team on this front and so many others. And it's why that if you are a teen in crisis listening to me right now, I want you to know that you can call me at any time of night or day and my colleagues and I will be there for you. In word, in deed, in budget, and in staff, we will be community that signals to all that this synagogue will embrace you in your imperfections, that we are here for saints and sinners, losers and winners, a place to bring your broken hallelujahs and sing them together with other lost souls. It's not in the mission statement of the synagogue, but maybe it should be. In a world of isolation, this synagogue offers community. In a world focused on the short term, this synagogue looks long. And in a world of judgment and cancellation, this synagogue offers forgiveness, grace, embrace, and refuge. No different than our Torah reading teaches, our community must be one where renewal and release are ever within reach. Unless you think the responsibility falls on the shoulders of the synagogue and its clergy, you are wrong. It falls on all of us. Martin Buber, as noted, translated many Hasidic stories, some by Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav. My favorite, and maybe yours too, is The Rooster Prince. It's a story I've told many times, but only now I actually think I know what it's all about. There was once a royal prince who fell ill, mentally ill, and was convinced he was a rooster. He sat beneath the royal table, naked, picking at bones and crumbs. His father, the king, called on all the royal physicians to treat his son with medicines, incantations, and miracle cures. But nothing made a difference. One day a sage volunteered to cure the prince. Where are your medicines, asked the king. I have my own ways, your majesty, answered the sage. Allow me seven days with the prince. Reluctantly, the king agreed. He had no other hope. When the sage was brought to the prince, he immediately undressed and sat under the table opposite the prince. Who are you, asked the prince, and what are you doing here? The sage answered, I'm a rooster. And you, what are you doing here? I'm a rooster too, said the prince, happy to have a friend. So they sat beneath the table together for a while. After a couple of days, the sage signaled to the king's servants to throw him two shirts. The sage put on the shirt, and before the prince could object, he said, what makes you think that a rooster can't wear a shirt? So the prince put on a shirt too, and so it was with the pants. What makes you think a rooster can't wear pants? The prince emulated the sage until they were both completely dressed. Next, the sage stopped eating off the floor and ordered that a meal be brought to the table. He asked the prince, what makes you think that a rooster can't sit at a table? So the prince sat at the table. This went on and on until eventually the sage left the prince acting, well, positively princely. The king rejoiced at seeing the prince return to his former self, and when in time the prince became a great king, role, ruling over the entire kingdom, no one other than he knew that he was still a rooster. <laughs> Our youth are living through a mental health emergency, a systemic crisis whose remedy is as complex as it is elusive. Each one of us, nevertheless, plays a role. No matter our station in life, all of us here can think of a young adult who, when the going gets rough, which it will, will need someone to whom they can turn for affirmation, for counsel, for forgiveness and refuge. So I ask you, have you done everything in your power to make sure that when that person arrives at your doorstep, they will know that you are there for them, that you will embrace them warmly, and that you will be fully present in an I-thou relationship. When that time comes, are you prepared to get down on the floor and validate their struggles in hopes of bringing them back up to the table? The answer to that question is in your hands. The stakes could not be higher. It could be a matter of life and death. Lest we forget, 
We are all just deeply, deeply imperfect birds of a feather, trying our level best to get through this world. If we're to do so successfully, then we must do so together. Shabbat Shalom.